with Simon Peter, Nathaniel, Thomas, James and John, a couple of other disciples went fishing. They knew how to fish, but they weren't sure about how they might be disciples of Jesus anymore. Jesus had been crucified. Yes, He had risen. Yes, He had appeared to them. Yes, they had stuck their... Thomas had stuck his hand in Jesus' side. But Peter's sin, his denial of Christ, his shame, seemed to be all that was left now. And it overwhelmed him. The fishing was bad that night. They caught nothing. That left the disciples some time to think. So Peter just sat there in the boat, remembering what had happened. He remembered that day in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus had asked the disciples, But who do you say that I am? Peter knew. Deep in his soul he knew and he said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus spoke those words to Peter. He would never forget those words. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And now I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And Peter thought to himself, he called me his rock. Some rock I turned out to be. He gave me the keys of heaven and I lost them. He said he would build his church on me. But what a poor foundation I turned out to be. He called me blessed. But now I feel cursed. And Peter thought about that time up on the mountain with Jesus with James and John. When Moses and Elijah appeared, and there Jesus was transfigured. Peter could not forget that. Jesus' clothes became dashing white, and God spoke to them. Peter has stood among the giants of the faith, but now he felt so very small. Then there was that awful night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus took James and John and Peter to the garden with him. And Jesus asked him just one thing, just one thing, to keep watch and pray for me. Three times Jesus asked them that, and three times they fell asleep on the watch. Peter thought, I couldn't even stay awake for my Lord. Of the disciples, Peter was the one who was bold. Peter was the one who spoke out. Peter was the leader. And so when Jesus told them that he was going to be arrested, Peter was outraged. That could not be so. But then Jesus said that all the disciples would run away and desert him in his time of need. And Peter said that even if all the rest desert you, Lord, I will not. I'll stand with you even unto the death. But Jesus said, Yes, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter remembered those words, and if he had any tears left, he would have wept again. But that night he ran off just like all the rest of them. But somewhere, somehow, he mustered a little bit of courage, so he followed at a distance as they took Jesus to the high priest. They took Jesus to the high priest. They had some kind of trial. They mocked Jesus. They beat him. Peter remembered that it was a cold and bitter night. He stayed down in the courtyard and tried to warm himself around a fire. There were guards everywhere. And Peter was so afraid. Then one of the serving girls of the high priest came by and she said, you also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it and said, I do not know or understand what you're talking about. 
So then he went out to the court, forecourt, and the, the cock crowed. And the serving girl on see him said, began to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, when the bystanders said again to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you're talking about. And that's when, that's when the, the rooster crowed the second time. And Peter remembered how he sat down and he cried. And he cried. And he cried. I sat at my computer writing this sermon. Had all my books piled up around me like usual. Had my Bible there in front. And I, I thought about how many times I denied Christ. You know, Jesus laid His claim on me when I was baptized. At my confirmation, I professed Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I said that I would put my whole trust in Him. I promised to serve Him as my Lord. Then there came that day. I'll never forget, I was sitting in a class there at Mount Sequoia. And the lecture was going and it started fading away. Lord God spoke to me, asked me, told me, said that I would be one of his pastors. And I vowed, Lord God, I'll do my best to serve you. I'll put everything aside, Lord God, and I'll preach your gospel. And even so, I said that. There's lots of other things in my life that I have done even since that time. I have not served God in a single-minded way. I have not fully devoted my life to be a disciple of Christ. And in the midst of all of this, like everybody else I've seen, I have not loved God with my whole heart. I've rebelled against God's love, not loved my neighbors, and my heart has turned stone cold against those who commit violence in the name of God. And yes, there's been time I've just closed my eyes, my ears to the cries of the needy because I'm just overwhelmed sometimes with all the things they need. So I got to wondering, each time I sin, do I deny Christ? Each time I sin, if I said, I don't know this man you're talking about. And so, as sometimes happens when you write a sermon, you begin to pray, Lord God, I hope not. And yet, I know this truth from my Bible. I know this truth because it's written on my heart. We deny Christ when we're disobedient to God. Because who was Christ if He wasn't the one who reconciled us to God? And if we deny the works of the reconciler, then we're probably denying the reconciler as well. We deny the power of the reconciler to change our lives. And instead, we accept the power of this world to have dominion over us. The power of greed, we chase after that little green god of wealth. The power of hate, when we despise our neighbors. The power of envy, when we want what others have. The power of addiction, when we want harmful things more than we want to be well. The power of pride, when we put our achievements above what God has done in our lives. All these worldly powers that we accept and we even embrace deny the sovereignty of Christ in our lives. And so we might, we might, we might just be living in rebellion against God. And when that happens, there's a verse that just haunts us out of Luke 12, verse 8. It might haunt us, it might convict us, and it says, I will tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. Hard words to hear. But in these words we find hope. I thank God that He gives us hope. Amen? Because there's two paths we can take. There's two ways that we can go. 
One path leads toward destruction, but the other path leads toward life. That path toward life has been set out before us from all the ancient days. The path by which we're set right with God. Friend, friends, God knows our weaknesses so very well. After all, He made us, right? And so He knows His creation, the one that He has crafted with His own hands. When I'm out in the shop making stuff, uh, sometimes the projects turn out pretty well. And yet, I know where all the flaws are in my little projects. Recently made a gift box for my son. That's it. It's a very good that thing is, uh, I made it for my son. He asked me to make a box for uh, a gift that he's asking his best man to be his best man. So he put some stuff in it. So I made this box right here. And uh, it's made out of oak. In fact, it's made out of a figured white oak. And I worked some long hours on that thing. And uh, it turned out well. You can't see it, but the lid does not quite align like it should. It's not perfect. The back of the hinges, or I should have set them out just a tiny bit more to give more range in the opening. And I have to confess, there's a few little places where I use some wood filler to hide some flaws. So it's not perfect, but I was real pleased with that, with that work. And I'm telling you this, God is pleased with the work He has done in each one of us, even though we're not perfect. Even though our lids may be dis disaligned a little bit, maybe our claws are hidden from view. And because God is pleased with us, because God loves His creation completely, because God is merciful, He has set this path before us of wholeness. If you're in the ranching business, Janice, if you're in the ranching business and, and you, you want to hang a gate properly, your gate posts have to be solid and sunk deep into the ground. Right, Dennis? Deep into the ground. Okay? Then on either side of that, of those gate posts, you set more posts. And you connect them together to offer support so they don't, so they don't sag. Well, we find the gate post of confession and repentance. They're on that pathway to wholeness. Raised on one side by our scripture, connected to us by the church, our traditions, and our sacraments. And then the other side, braced by our experience, and our reason, the work of the Holy Spirit that binds us all together with God and with His Christ. And the gate, the gate, that's Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We learn there in John the 10th chapter, this is what Jesus said. He said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come and go out and find pasture. Jesus is the gate to our path of wholeness. And down that path we find forgiveness of sin. Down that path we find life. Down that path we find salvation. Hanging right there above that gate. There's a signpost that's been there since all eternity. Jeremiah wrote about this. He wrote in God's words back in chapter 31. He said, No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Forgiveness is God's disremembrance of our sin. I don't know if disremembrance is even a word. That's what God does. And I'll tell you this. When the sovereign of the universe forgets our sin, that sin is truly and completely and forever forgotten like it never happened, like the denial never happened and the rooster never crowed. Our slate is wiped clean. And we're born once again new and whole. Back on that little beach where the disciples had gathered. 
They finished what they were eating. They finally caught some fish because guess who came from the sea? It was Jesus. They faced the Jesus that they thought was gone. They re-entered the world of discipleship that they thought was finished. And Jesus asked Peter, comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. When he asked Peter, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. The second time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, in my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was so hurt that Jesus asked him that third time. <coughs> but Peter understood that asking because it was to erase the denying. So Peter said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Friends, even if we deny Christ, He never denies us. God's love is steadfast. Nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. The path to hold us is always set right in front of us. Forgiveness is just a, a prayer away. And so when we receive that thrice fold forgiveness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we are sent forth to tell others to tend God's sheep, to feed them, to show others this path that, that God has shown to us, to show the sinners of the world just like us how this path is. And then we sit back and we witness the awesome, life-changing power of God's forgiveness and His grace. Amen.